Good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in to Think Tech Friday. I'm your host, Attila Saras. Here on Think Tech, we like to do things a little bit differently than every other show. We look for the next big thing. And here in Hawaii and across the world, there's something really big happening, but it's not on the ground. It's up in the skies, under the water, and even in outer space. Joining us today is Larry Osborne. He's the, uh, I guess, the VP uh, over here at the Hawaii division of Dreamhammer. Now, Dreamhammer is a software company that makes the software that actually runs on all these physical pieces of equipment that are under the water and in the skies. So, Larry, thank you for joining us today on the show. Really appreciate you coming down. Sure. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, exactly what we do. Yes. And and that is, uh, if you think about drones, you can think of three major components. Exactly. Yeah. But you can think about the platform like the airplane. Mm -hmm. You can think about that and the sensors that ride on it, cameras, radars, whatever uh, is on that. And then you can think about a communication segment that might be a data link that communicates with that device. And then somewhere there's got to be a place where the operator actually controls, controls the drone and manages manages the functions of the drone. So we build the software that controls the drone. And what we do is build software that is universal. So any drone can be controlled in our software. Uh, whether it's legacy or whether it's based on a standard, we can communicate with and control that drone, which is a really important thing when you think about, uh, let's say, the uh, the Army that has different kinds of drones. They have to train to different ones. Uh, we make that process simple, put it on one platform, so they only have to train to one piece of software. And we can also bring in all kinds of command and control functionality so that the operator uh, is able to do the mission, not just control the drone and manage the sensors that are on it. So that's, that's what we do, and that is a, is a new concept, and it's a kind of disruptive technology, which is, uh, you might compare it to, uh, uh, if you remember, not so long ago, computers were very much stovepiped. If I owned a, a, a Unisys computer, I had to go out and buy Unisys memory or Unisys disk drives in order to, um, to use that. Well, now you can go buy a printer from anybody, right? Right, and right. you plug it into your, your computer and drivers run it and, it and it works, plug and play. Well, that's the environment that we want to bring to drones. So that any drone can be controlled by our software and it's just an easy integration and we make it simple for the operator to manage that drone. Now, who, who makes these drones and who uses them? Well, the drones are made by, uh, by a lot of people, but kind of what's going on now is that the, uh, uh, the, the U.S. military has really led the way with drones uh, because they had a need in places like Iraq and Afghanistan to use these drones to, uh, for surveillance. And uh, so, so that has really led the market. And right now, it is very difficult to fly in a drone in U.S. airspace. You need an exception from the FAA, and there are all these exceptions are only given to government agencies, both oh. federal and state agencies. So without that kind of permission, you can't even operate a drone. Now, what's changing is that Congress has directed the FAA to um, it undertake some airspace integration so we can safely integrate these unmanned aircraft with commercial traffic and other uh, private traffic that is, uh, is occupying our what we'll call the national airspace now. And in order to do that, a number of technologies have to be uh, fleshed out, proven, and certified. And processes as well to certify these unmanned systems and the uh, supporting systems that are aboard so that they can safely operate alongside you know, commercial aviation. But once that happens, and Congress has directed that this should happen by 2015, uh, once that happens, there's going to be a tremendous commercial uh, demand for these unmanned systems. Uh, I can give you an example right now. Uh, uh, an example is Alaska, where they've actually have opened up some airspace. And they're doing things with unmanned systems now in Alaska that you could do with manned aircraft, but so much more expensive to do it that way. So they're, uh, they're using unmanned systems to manage wildlife. Uh, they can go out and uh, count Arctic seals in places that are often inaccessible any other way. Uh, the oil industry in Alaska can use unmanned systems and are using them to inspect drill heads that aren't managed, that aren't manned, I'll say, and uh, also to inspect pipelines. Now, I know that in Eastern Europe, 
they were they were they were uh, monitoring graffiti on the train tracks with these uh, uh, with these unmanned. I, I hadn't heard that, but I, I can imagine how they could be used that yeah, way. Yeah, it's it's perfect. You know, they thing yes. shows up and you know can't shoot little BBs at them, but they were using. Uh, I think like uh, off the shelf, almost fifty thousand dollar remote control helicopters to do this. Mm -hmm. Now, does your technology is it completely autonomous? Can I just say deliver a package, you know, to point A, or is well, it well? It, it requires a little more than that. Okay, but um, and it's it'll be interesting. I know you're referring to Amazon, right? Uh, well, where, where they you said uh, it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had a they they have a particular problem in that uh, uh, they have a problem with last mile delivery. In, in other words, they have that last mile to get the package somewhere. It could, uh, it could be aboard a ship, it can be aboard a large aircraft, gets to the airport, uh, gets to their distribution center, and then somehow that package has to get to your house. And that's very expensive to, uh, to operate trucks and, and drive them down. And, and, and their, their vision was that they could deliver you know, five pound packages with small UAVs. Now, it's, first of all, you, you've got to solve the airspace problem. And uh, you know you've got to be able to operate these drones in the airspace. And there's probably a lot of liability that goes along with carrying packages through the air uh, over people's heads. And uh, mm -hmm. it, you probably have some other challenges, uh, particularly here in Hawaii. I can think of high-rise condos, and and how do I get my package? You know, once it gets dropped at the front door there. Mm -hmm. So they probably have some hurdles, but it's an interesting concept to think about. At Dreamhammer, we think a lot about on-man freight. In other words, a great expense, uh, there's a great expense in pilots that fly uh, FedEx, UPS aircraft hauling freight. Uh, those could be on-man systems. Interesting. Interesting. Because that's uh, what Google's doing with their drivers. They want to replace the exactly. taxi drivers. Exactly. They the want to replace drivers. taxi drivers, truck drivers, uh, and, and we're certainly positioned to, uh, to enter that market. But we're also positioned uh, to enter the market of, uh, of airborne freight. And, uh, and for that, you know, you, you could even think of ocean delivered vessels as well could be on man. And, and there's a tremendous uh, savings there to be had in, in doing it that way. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking at in the future uh, for on man systems. Uh, we can think, of, you know, I'll give you another example in Alaska. Uh, they actually used unmanned systems. Uh, they had some fisheries closed uh, by, by the uh, federal government. Uh, and, uh, and what they did was took some unmanned systems and they surveyed these fisheries and they found out that the estimates for the numbers of, of the fish were inaccurate. And they reopened an industry that was worth millions of dollars to them because they had collected the data that was required to justify that and show that these fisheries were, were healthy and robust and that they could still support some of the fishing that they wanted to do there. So they, they flew over and saw the fish or did they go they, under they, the water? They, no, these, these were air vehicles and they flew over to see the fish and uh, were able to do some counts and support, uh, support reopening some fisheries that had been closed. But I see here in Hawaii, you know, when you think about our Northwest Hawaiian Islands and, uh, and protecting wildlife and counting wildlife, and managing our fisheries that UAVs can bring tremendous value. They can also be used uh, in an agriculture setting. Uh, you can do things with a technology called hyperspectral imaging where you can determine whether or not a crop needs more water, whether it needs more or less fertilizer. Uh, you can probably identify invasive species. And so there's an awful lot that you can do uh, from the air that way and with an unmanned system you can collect data, do it very inexpensively, and that's the value that these devices will bring. And you don't need to be a trained pilot. This, no. That's the whole point. And, and again, right? that's, yeah. that's something that the software brings, is that uh, these systems can be rather autonomous, and flying them can be as easy as telling them where to land, you know, directing them to take off and go to some point in space, and then actually in our software use a touch screen to change the route, and manage the sensor and collect the data. So you don't need to be a pilot. Now you do need to be aware of where you are in the airspace and make sure that you don't stray from where you're supposed to be. And these new technologies that will allow unmanned systems to fly and mix with commercial systems will have to have some autonomous ability, in other words, some ability to act alone 
uh, to see non-cooperative aircraft and avoid them all by themselves. But those technologies are being developed now. And what, what's ahead of us is doing the test and evaluation to certify those technologies so that we can get on with uh, opening up this airspace and then uh, opening these commercial opportunities. And, and I'm particularly excited about the opportunities here in Hawaii because uh, we are teamed with Alaska uh, to be designated as one of six FAA test sites uh, where these technologies will be tested by the FAA. And we have no better place than Hawaii to do it. We have uh, the most benign climate on the planet. We have lots of airspace. And we are developing I believe in our schools through our excellent STEM programs. We're developing a workforce that is ready to step into this industry because there will be opportunities for engineers, there will be opportunities for operators, there will be opportunities for maintenance, uh, and there will be opportunities for software development. And uh, those skills I think are being served well by the STEM program in our schools. So as you see, there, there's opportunities to bring a lot of uh, very good jobs to Hawaii along with this technology once we get through the FAA hurdle and, and get, it, uh, get it certified to operate safely in the national airspace. Uh, and then we will take, see this industry take off. Uh, by some estimates, uh, this could be a, uh, an $80 billion industry worldwide. At least. Yes. And it's highly in sustainable. The next decade, yeah. And highly sustainable. Uh, and it's very disruptive technology uh, because it'll do a lot of things uh, that we don't do effectively now or that we can't afford to do now because uh, uh, they rely on manned aircraft. I mean, think of the expense, for example, uh, of operating, uh, of uh, the local police departments operating helicopters, you know? Uh, to have trained pilots and observers and, and, that, and all the expense that comes with manned helicopters when they can do this same job with drones and, and put those officers on the ground and, and still collect the data from the air. Well, but isn't, isn't, isn't the point that they have some liability? They, they need to have someone actually up in an airplane to well, make those calls. Right? Uh, you, 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 need, uh, you need the right technology, the right smarts in that drone so that it can react to uh, a loss of communications or it can react to um, uh, some non-cooperative uh, air vehicle that's in the same airspace and be able to avoid it safely. You know, performing those same functions that a, a pilot would perform in an aircraft. Uh, and there's almost an advantage to the unmanned system as well, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this as a, as a former pilot, in, in that um, they will, um, if the software is right, uh, they will respond in a much more predictable way than a human being will. And often uh, you can manage the system uh, and manage system failures uh, better in an autonomous manner than a, than a pilot in the aircraft could. Oh, absolutely. G Google will back you up with their uh, unmanned vehicles. Same thing. They say they can eliminate up to 90% of all car crashes. Well, think of all the people we kill on the highways these days. Yes. And, and how much uh, could be avoided. And you know, think about, too, being able to go to work on the H1, bumper to bumper at 60 miles an hour, and, and be completely safe. Well, here's know? what I'm going to do. I'm going to get some of your unmanned vehicles and hang on to it. <laughs> exactly. And just have it take me over all those cars. But Exactly. And read the paper while you're going. <laughs> yes. Right? And text, maybe, at the same time. Sure. 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 And talk on the phone. And shave. <laughs> You know, it's, it's closer to the truth than you think. Exactly. We have to run to a quick break. Uh, I'm your host, Attila Cerez, for Think Tech Friday. With us today is Larry Osborne. He's the Chief Strategy Officer for DreamHammer here in Honolulu, Hawaii. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this break. We want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company. 
a proponent of the Liquefied Natural Gas Initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashen. See you next time. We're back, we're live, and you're watching Think Tech Friday. I'm your host, Attila Sares. With us today is Larry Osborne. He's the, uh, what we call it, Chief Strategy Officer yes. for uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, we're talking about drones. And drones, particularly how they're going to change the world and beyond. But before we can get there, we have some obstacles standing in front of us here at the FAA. Why don't you tell me a little bit more about that and how Hawaii sure. can be put on the map as sure. the number one place for drones to be flown. Um, almost uh, almost three years ago, Congress uh, was looking at the commercial opportunities and saw that the obstacle was being able to operate unmanned systems in the national airspace. And so they directed the FAA to um, uh, study the problem and to, uh, to select six test sites at which technologies will be evaluated and tested that will lead to them being able to certify unmanned systems to operate in the national airspace with other commercial traffic. Since that time, uh, it's taken them almost two years to uh, put out uh, a request for proposals from states and other agencies, other government agencies, to bid on uh, to to present the case that they should be selected as as one of the six test sites. And I, I believe there's more than 30 applications out there now. Wow. And the FAA hasn't selected one yet. But we do expect an announcement before the end of the year. Uh, uh, within this year? Within the end of this calendar year, we really? expect uh, we do expect an announcement from the FAA. Uh, they may not um, announce all six designations, but they may announce one or two. And we also think that Hawaii is on a winning team in this. And um, uh, Hawaii is teamed with Alaska and Oregon. Alaska is the uh, sort of the lead on this, and uh, Hawaii is part of that team. And uh, that team submitted a bid uh, more than a year ago, I guess almost a year ago, uh, to become one of these six test sites. And uh, a very, very good proposal was submitted. Uh, and Alaska was very well organized. They have uh, a group that is centered with their university uh, in Fairbanks. And uh, they, um, they led this effort. So we hope that in the next month or so that Hawaii will be designated uh, as part of this winning team to be one of the six test sites. Well, now, what is it about Hawaii that makes it so special, though? I um, mean, it's there's lots of other flatter sure, places on, sure. in this country, a lot more remote places. In well, this country. Uh, one one thing is is that uh, our location is great because we aren't encumbered with a lot of uh, of uh, air routes. Oh. There, there. Uh, we do have a lot of aircraft in and out of Hawaii, but they're on well-defined paths, and uh, they don't restrict us from using a lot of airspace over water that is already defined as restricted airspace and can be made available for a lot of these uh, these test events. So, uh, we're an excellent location, and I think I mentioned before that we have the most benign weather on the planet. And that's important to anybody that wants to come and test because they're not going to lose time to bad weather. Oh, when like they snow come here. or whatever. Right, yeah. right. And so, uh, so we should be able to attract um, developers, integrators, government people to come and test here. We also have some, some great test ranges and training ranges. And uh, I think the two preeminent ones I, I could mention, one is the PTA over on the Big Island that is a, a great place to fly unmanned systems in a, in a higher altitude, mountainous type environment. And, and we also have the PMRF on, on Kauai uh, that could be used for some of this activity as well. And then we have all this airspace uh, to use offshore. So it, it's a, an ideal place and we should be. Hawaii should be the capital of this activity, this, the, the center of excellence uh, for this kind of activity. Uh, we also have that proximity to the Pacific Rim, 
Uh, and those countries certainly have a lot of interest in this technology as well. So uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we will be designated as a test site and that we'll be able to attract uh, this activity to our state to create jobs. Now we're not just talking about flying vehicles, we're also talking about, I believe you and I were talking about undersea vehicles too. Exactly. Right? I, I mean, uh, if you think about Hawaii, uh, we have uh, uh, everything uh, from underwater test ranges that the military operates to, uh, to instrumentation and range coverage on the surface of the ocean to uh, lots of airspace, uh, again with radar coverage over water. And we even have, uh, uh, through the uh, auspices of, of the Navy and the PMRF on Hawaii, we have space corridors that are part of that test range. Space corridors? Space corridors. So that, we can send them into orbit? Well, we, we, we could uh, even uh, uh, test with uh, vehicles that are in space or returning from space or going into space. So, so Hawaii could become a place. Uh, where on-man systems in all of these domains, land, surface, undersurface, air, and space, are, are tested and developed. Because there's going to come a time, and I think the time is, is almost past due, when these vehicles, especially for national security kinds of applications, need to work in cooperation with each other. Uh, think about an underwater vehicle that's on-manned that's collecting data, listening, whatever, uh, or could be even collecting uh, scientific data underwater. Uh, these are long endurance vehicles that can spend a lot of time underwater, and of course we have difficulty communicating with devices underwater. So they have to surface periodically and either communicate with a satellite, that is what, it's an unmanned system, or with a drone in the air, unmanned system, upload some data, get some instructions, and then go back underwater and work for a while to come back at a, and surface at another pointed, you know, a pointed time and space and, uh, and time where they can do that again. Well, I know one of the things I heard recently was that Hawaii is a, is a hot spot for upcoming mining in the next few years. Rare earth metals found all throughout the islands. Could a drone go down there, drill, get some materials, bring it back up, that kind of work? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of that will be done by drones. And as a matter of fact, as Dreamhammer, uh, we're talking to a, a global commercial company about uh, controlling their very large vehicles that are involved in strip mining. Because these big trucks are, are huge machines with wheels that are, you know, 15 feet tall or in diameter. And um, these are, are unmanned vehicles. And so uh, they, uh, we, we are talking to them about using our software to manage these vehicles and to visualize what they're doing in a, in a display on a computer. Now, is there a difference in, in terminology between unmanned and, and like a piloted vehicle? Like this huge truck, I'm sure someone's driving it somewhere, maybe with a little Nintendo joystick, something like that. But it's not just autonomously just doing whatever it's going to do. Well, there, there are some functions, uh, and, and part of the job that we're doing as a software company is to make as much uh, of, that, uh, of those activities autonomous as we can. Because we want to simplify that interaction for the human. Because the world is becoming increasingly, increasingly complex, right? And, and you can read about the Internet of Things. And uh, we have software that is designed to communicate with that Internet of Things, simplify that process, uh, and so to, to bring you know, some clarity and simplification to what is becoming an increasingly complex world with all the networking that's going on with all these devices. It kind of makes me think of Wally. We watched that with my four-year-old <laughs> exactly. yesterday. You know, he's a little square and he, he's a garbage collector. That's, that's a perfect application for a robot. No of course. To go uh, you know, robots uh, do all the, uh, all, all the dirty, dangerous, and, uh, and, and drudgery. I believe in an old ep episode of Star Trek, I believe it was Voyager, they had like the doctor go on and, and do mining on an asteroid because it was, it was so dangerous that only robots could do it. Exactly. And we'll find more and more of that, you know, and, and, uh, and, and people will be uh, removed from some of these uh, dangerous uh, drudgery type of, type of work, and it'll be done by unmanned systems, robots, drones, subsurface surface vehicles. Or just think about the mining opportunities that are out of this planet. I mean, uh, I don't, we, exactly. we usually like to talk about the future near the end of the show, but I think it's, it's great to talk about. I mean, uh -huh. I've heard of rumors of, of uh, mining the moon or mining the asteroid belt. Because there'd be incredible resources there, mm -hmm. 
I mean, we're not going to send people to do that. Uh, well, and, and we're also positioned in Hawaii, I think, where we're not disadvantaged in being able to participate in this new market segment. In other words, uh, we can do engineering in Hawaii. We can develop software in Hawaii. And we're not, it's, it's not like a manufacturing paradigm where you have to ship things back and forth because, because our product uh, will be knowledge. Mm. And, and I think through the STEM programs in the schools here locally, the really excellent STEM pro programs in many of the schools, we are positioning ourselves for that so that our workforce here can do things from Hawaii, living in Hawaii, participating in this economy that, uh, that, that these days typically we lose to the mainland. How soon? <laughs> Well, I, I don't simple know. Simple question, I know. It, it's a simple question, but it's a very difficult one. I think we're going to have to wait and see how soon. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's difficult. Uh, the FAA has a difficult task because their business is safety. And they don't get paid to say yes. They get paid to make sure that uh, when we fly in commercial aircraft that we're not incurring any additional risk. And so, uh, I can't tell you how soon it's going to be. But I do know that there are lots of incentives for industry to get it done quickly because of all the opportunity that's in front of us uh, by, by using these drones in the national airspace. So is there sort of a, a timeline, uh, certain things that need to happen in order for this to, um, to work? Th there are, is and, there, and there, there, is a, there is a master plan that has been put together by uh, five or six agencies within the federal government that would include the Department of Defense, the FAA in the lead position, of course, and uh, the Department of Homeland Security has interest, as does NASA. Uh, as does the transportation department. So th those departments are, are all working in concert uh, to try not to duplicate effort in developing the kinds of technologies and focusing the research and development in the right direction uh, so that we get to that end point as quickly as possible. You know, it's interesting. There, there seems to be a pivoting point where a lot of things become possible due to a certain innovation coming to market. So, for example, a good software operating system is what allowed the personal computer. I agree. A good, uh, you know, open source, you know, later commercialized operating system is what made Android smartphones finally be able to compete with Apple and, mm -hmm. and in fact, iOS in the first place. That was that was the first real shift in a. Yeah, so, you know, well, so you know, for for Apple, th th it was very good for them because they controlled both the hardware and the software. Right. Uh, I, and I think we're not going to see a situation like that anymore, where, where one entity controls both that tightly. So this industry, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there, and they're building all kinds of unmanned systems. Um, and I, I think the advantage that we have at DreamHammer in terms of, uh, of, of how we have structured our business is that it's going to be software that brings it all together. And it's a, it's a software solution that uh, is open architecture and that communica can communicate with uh, any network device uh, and is, is built to a standard that, um, that, that people can get behind. Uh, that's what's going to make all of this uh, truly affordable. And, uh, and it's what's going to commoditize this industry uh, because the, the, the stovepipes uh, typically um, typically don't work for too long. Mm, Stovepipes. Because well, somebody finds a better way to do it. Well, and that's the thing. You guys got to stay ahead of the curve. But Exactly. Uh, just stay with us for one moment. This is a very fun conversation. We're here with Larry Osborne. Uh, he's the Chief Strategy Officer for DreamHammer here in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm your host, Attila Suresh. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Fidel. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. We have some news for you. In addition to our ThinkTech TV show and our Asia in Review show on Olelo 54, as of January 1st, we're adding Community Matters to play also two hours a week. Check out thinktechaway.com for the specific times of each of these shows. We hope you enjoy all three. Mahalo, I'm Jay Fidel. Aloha, I'm Maria Kashem of ThinkTech Hawaii, and I want to tell you about our ThinkTech talk shows. If you didn't know it, ThinkTech streams video and audio for all of its shows live on the internet from 2 to 5 p.m. every weekday afternoon. And we replay them all night long on Ustream.tv. 
Visit ThinkTechHawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links. Raise your awareness on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem, and I'll see you. We're back, we're live, and thank you so much for tuning in to Think Tech Friday. I'm your host, Attila Saras. With us today is Larry Osborne of Dreamhammer here in Honolulu, Hawaii. Thank you for joining us in the show. You bet. Before we uh, went to the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, some of these applications and you know some of the hurdles that we have to overcome in order for drones to start flying in the skies here in Hawaii. Uh, now, why don't you tell me a little bit about the, maybe a little bit about the political landscape and the commercial landscape here. Who are the players? Who are your competition? Sure. And uh, maybe some of the privacy issues and maybe some of the reliability issues that mm -hmm. we're likely to encounter when you have a bunch of people creating hardware for a single software operating system. Sounds okay. a lot like Windows. It does. <laughs> well, let me, uh, I, let me start with, uh, I think, what uh, a lot of people have concern about, and that is the privacy issue. Uh, and I, I'll tell you that last year in our state legislation, legislature, uh, we actually had some uh, uh, legislation proposed that would have banned drones from Hawaii. I heard about that. Yeah. Yes, and, and so, uh, so what's going on this year is that um, Representative Gene Ward has uh, introduced some legislation uh, that is modeled after uh, other legislation that has been uh, proposed in other states that addresses the privacy concerns while not inhibiting the development of this technology. And the legislation addresses things like uh, making sure that, that no individual is tracked by a drone unless there is a warrant behind it, uh, that there's no reuse of the data that's collected by a drone uh, without a search warrant, um, and that um, that people's privacy issues are respected and uh, kind of a, a no nuisance language to make sure that the drones don't become a nuisance to anybody and that the drones don't carry weapons of any kind. I think that's fair. So, uh, and also it directs the, uh, the police departments in the state and law enforcement to abide by some guidelines that have been developed by the International Association of Police Chiefs. And so they've developed guidelines for the use of drones that, uh, that ensures that these, these basic pr principles of, uh, of protecting uh, privacy are, uh, uh, are protected and, and that uh, the, the law enforcement officers uh, have some guidelines for, for how to use drones that, that will work. How secure are these things? I mean, could a hacker theoretically take over one of these drones and start Picking well, up some of that information. That's, that's always a concern. Yeah. And so that's uh, part of the responsibility of the, uh, the system integrator and the, the software developers like our company uh, to make sure that the software and the entire system is built to a standard that makes it very difficult for that to be done. But not impossible, as we know. Well, I, I, I never use the word impossible. That's, uh, but that, that's a huge liability then. But it makes sense if you don't have any uh, weapons aboard one. It's a lot safer, right? I, and, I think so, yeah. yes. And um, so who else is doing something like this here? Are there any other operating we, systems um, for drones? You know, um, there are many operating systems for drones. Uh, our platform, though, is very unique in that we're much like an iPhone. Uh, our software is designed so that uh, the manufacturers or the integrators can build applications on top of our software. And so... Um, and so whoever integrates with our software becomes interoperable with everybody else that has integrated with our software, much like your iPhone is interoperable. So in particular for a government customer where they're used to a five-year development cycle, 15-year tech refresh, which makes no sense anymore in the information technology world, um, they can get tech refresh whenever there's a new app. So in, in, uh, in looking at our software that is a basic you know, control for an unmanned system, uh, somebody can build an app to give you a weather display so that the operator sees the weather as he's operating his drone. And if somebody builds a better weather display, what do you do? You, you get rid of that app and you get a new app, right, that's better. So you get tech refresh as technology comes along. And that's a very powerful thing. And that's the way we've built our platform and uh, we have not seen uh, any other competitor that has, uh, has done that. Well, but to be fair, that's a standard ERP software licensing model where you build a framework and then you modularize out 
yes. whatever. But this way, you're opening up those modules to be any third party. Which exactly, is kind of nice. and and uh, and and that's the way we market our software. We market it not to the government directly, but to those integrators and manufacturers that support the government. And so, how many software development companies are currently writing what we would oh, call apps? Uh, you know, uh, oh, we have. Uh, uh, at least a dozen early adopters now. We oh, just okay. have uh, just recently re released our first production version of, of this software. So we have a, a number of uh, early adopters, including uh, the large tier one companies that support the Department of Defense, the big manufacturers. Uh, I could mention one is Lockheed Martin, for example, wow. is one that's using our software now. Uh, for various applications, and there are others as well. Yes, and, and again, I, I'll mention we were, you know, we were sort of constructed on a on a standard that was developed by DoD, but nobody had built a product to that standard until we did. So we built the first product to that standard. So could a small startup, like you mentioned here, you know, we have the STEM program. These kids are coming out. They have some programming experience. Could they start up a company, a two-man company, and write a software plugin? And realistically. Absol ab absolutely can. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the beauty of this concept in that it really levels the playing field. Because now, um, now you, like you said, a small startup with some smart people in it can uh, f build some killer app and uh, have it uh, become part of a much larger system. I like it. And how many machines are out there right now running this operating system? Oh, gosh, I, I don't know. I, ca I can't give you that number. In the hundreds of thousands? No, it, it would be in the in the dozens now. Oh, in but, the dozens. But that'll grow as time goes so on. So it's new. It's a fairly it's new It's new. Thing. It's very new. That's yes. a perfect time. You and I need to talk. Maybe we can start a small <laughs> little startup here. Get some kids to write a, well, a weather app for your exactly for your thing. Exactly. And, and we're going to be working with universities um, you know, to uh, make our software available to them so that they can write apps on our software. Uh, so we've talked to a number of leading in, uh, universities that are, are going to take our, you know, uh, sort of our educational version, a free version of our software so that they can develop on it. Because it puts you so much further ahead. Typical uh, development of, a, of a, a command and control system takes a very long time and is very, very expensive because everybody starts from scratch. And we've, ad we've taken advantage of a lot of open source software. Uh, like, for example, our, our GIS model, our, our globe, is NASA WorldWind, which is uh, basically freeware. It was developed by NASA. Now, we, we highly modify it, and we do a, a number of, of very special things with that software. But it's open source software. So wow. we do leverage that in our technology stack. And the operating system that uh, that this we we, we build on uh, we build on Java, so we're really hardware and operating system agnostic. So mm -hmm. anybody can run our software, which is another great advantage in that we don't put demands on our users that they have very high end software, uh, high end oh, I see. unique uh, unique hardware requirements to run our software. So someone could run like a Raspberry Pi. Well, you need you need <laughs> pretty good uh, pretty good graphics card. Graphics. Uh, oh, yeah, for because the it is very, yeah, the visuals are, are, can be very graphic intensive. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, probably what 80% uh, of people have in their offices uh, on their laptops uh, could run our software. And so they would put that software onto a, onto a computer, mm -hmm. uh, the Java based, and then they would code in, I'm guessing, Eclipse or something we, like that. We have uh, APIs mm -hmm. that they can integrate with so they can take their their system, integrate with our software. And, and now have that kind of uh, visualization and operating system. And so then the next step would be a drone, right? To actually load that, plug it onto a drone or to sell it well, to someone. Well, we, we typically, yeah, we would integrate with the, uh, with the autopilot on the drone, which, which controls the drone. We'd integrate, uh, those typically have software packages for integration. We integrate with that, or they integrate with that using our software development kit. And, uh, and they're off, off and running. Of course, they have to have a communication segment as well, because you've got to communicate with the vehicle. Are you looking at uh, an OEM distribution model where you would take a software product that someone had developed, say locally, uh, put it into your SKU inventory and then go through your distribution yeah, one channels? Of the, uh, I, I can uh, speak for uh, DOD. One of the uh, challenges we had is that um, uh, every DOD manufacturer of drones has their own software to run the drone, right. okay. which is a problem for DOD because they pay so much to maintain all that and each one is unique in a stovepipe, right? And they have to train to each one. 
So by integrating their existing system with our software, we bring them to an OSD standard so that now everybody can come together on our platform. And they can still keep those uh, proprietary ingredients and the special sauce that makes them special, yet they're interoperable with their competitors' platforms. Yeah, but think of the small startup running a little... The uh, small little startup can... They would go to you and then you would talk to the military for that. Well, right? or, or we just, they just buy our software development kit and they develop software and go to the military and sell it. Directly, okay. Directly. So you're not looking to enhance your software by because you know, for example, uh, you know, you brought you brought up Apple, Apple and Android. They both buy companies and they add they add software products into their kind of their core, and that's what they push out to the end users. Well, that so that, that may be in our future, but um, but really, we think the the value is creating this market that is a that's a level playing field. And uh, people can take our software development kit and do something that we know, can't imagine I, right now. But I don't want to go talk to the military. I want you to do it for me. Well, so if I make a great app, I give it to you, and you say, "Okay, talk to the talk to the guys in hats." And, well, uh, can you we, do we that? would say go talk to Lockheed Martin. There, oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you're interested more in those kind of bigger relationships. We're, we're, we're in, yes, and we're interested more in uh, in providing the platform on which we can make all this happen. Hmm. Eventually, yes. For the, for the little guys. For the little guys. As long as we get to that. So we would have to solicit separately. I mean, you see what I'm saying. Uh, for, Absolutely. For example, uh, every big touchscreen maker is looking for the next big software app. So if you if you go buy a big touchscreen, you know, it's fantastic from uh, Elo, for example. Sure. Elo, they, they invented the touchscreen 50 years ago. You can go to their factory and they say, we'll give you this touchscreen. Here you go. But you plug it in and it's a blank screen. Right? Mm -hmm. It's completely useless without some piece of software. So they've picked up uh, items inside of their their in their in their channels, right? Sure, sure. So they have uh, you know, for example, a virtual receptionist. They have like a real estate listing software. So mm -hmm. there's there's other software packages that they can say like, all right, you want to buy our, our our hardware, but you need you need something. So oh, yeah. let let us put this into your into your into your line. So I didn't know if that was part of Dreamhammer. Well, I, I, I can tell that. you yeah. a little bit. We we have a, a core platform called the Dreamhammer platform. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we have a product called Ballista, which is our on-man system software. Uh, this year, we'll release a product called Omni, which is generic command and control. In other words, not designed necessarily to control UAVs, but it can communicate with any network device, and it provides generic command and control. So somebody can come and build an app on that. And now Ballista, Omni, all of those applications are all running in the same environment and all interoperable. Uh, we are also going to release a product very soon called Morningstar, which is a commercial version of a job we did for PACOM for disaster uh, relief humanitarian assistance for spectrum collaboration so that when the Red Cross goes somewhere and the other governments go to Thailand, let's say, for a tsunami, they can manage the spectrum so they don't interfere with each other's radios when they go to humanitarian assistance disaster relief work. And uh, so we're, we're going to build a, oh, a, cool. a yeah. commercial version of that. And uh, we are also uh, looking into the future, uh, thinking about versions for logistics, for example, or for electronic warfare. We have a, a, a what I'll call a 4D uh, visualization environment that is tied to the, the physical world. So that um, uh, we're looking for some smart person to take our electronic warfare basic application and go visualize the spectrum. Basic warfare application. I, I don't know what that so, means. Tell me about it. <laughs> well, um, well, uh, uh, threat radars have a certain uh, threat envelope, etc. And so, uh, if you can visualize that and see the battle space better, you can be more effective in deploying your assets. I guess I'll just kind of leave it at that. Oh, I but, see. So if you can see the battlefield a little bit better, you know where to shoot, or you know where yeah. not to go. Where not to if go. There's a threat somewhere. There's a threat somewhere. Okay, so a lot of military apps, and you know, certainly. Great thing is we have all this, all this wonderful climate change happening. Oh sure. This is perfect. This is this is a, this is a wide open playing field for you because uh, now we can send out these drones to go pick people up. 
who are drowning, right? Yeah. Yes. Or they, they can go uh, look at the Northwest Passage and see where the ice is. Oh. Where well, the ice isn't. I want to talk about the future, but we got to save that for the last few minutes of the show. Okay. All right. Thank you for uh, joining us, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Attila Suress. I'm the host for Think Tech Friday, and uh, with us today we have Larry Osborne. He is the Chief Strategy Officer for Dreamhammer. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaiian Foreign Trade Zone, number nine, has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBED, the Hawaii Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program. It does so to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Mahalo. We're back, we're live, and you're watching Think Tech Friday. I'm your host, Attila Sares. With us today is Larry Osborne. He's his chief strategy officer for a company called Dream, Dreamhammer. Now, Dreamhammer uh, sounds pretty rough, but they actually make some really cool software that runs those unmanned machines that you've seen probably in movies and science fiction films and all kinds of stuff, but they're bringing it to life here in Hawaii. And we're very honored to have him on the show. Thank you. Thank for you. It. Now, uh, we want to talk about the future of these unmanned, unmanned uh, vehicles and both above, above uh, water and below water, maybe in outer space, too. Uh, have you guys thought about taking these things into well, space? Well, we have a lot because uh, there, there's uh, everything in outer space is unmanned right now, right? With a few exceptions like the International Space Station. As long as their cooling system doesn't fail, we're okay, right? <laughs> but, you know, think about the constellations that we have of communication satellites of uh, GPS, of weather satellites. Uh, these are just unmanned vehicles that happen to be in space. And uh, that industry that was uh, very expensively constructed because each is a stovepipe, so each type of satellite reinvented this control mechanism. Um, that's also a market where uh, some commoditization of some of the, uh, the the basic building blocks, like the control segment software that we do for drones, is an opportunity uh, for us. But uh, let's go back to some of the applications, I think, is what you wanted to talk about a little bit, right? Oh, the exciting stuff. Yeah, yeah the good course. stuff. So uh, let, let's, uh, let, let's think about Hawaii a little bit. And we, we talked about some of this, but uh, uh, think about all of our coastline and all of the ports that we have in Hawaii uh, that are uh, vital to us. Uh, you know, what do they say? And if, if we lose our ports for four days, we'll all start getting hungry, right? So, um, so drones can be a big part of uh, our port security. And uh, again, uh, our job at Dreamhammer is to make the control of those very, very simple for the operator. Uh, because we want to remove all the complexity, and that's what we do. But um, we can inexpensively have drones uh, do port security uh, for us. Uh, and now smart people will write apps on top of our control segment software uh, that will tell you if they see an anomaly. Oh, gee, look, there's something in the water that we hadn't seen before. Or there's a, a big package here that just appeared on the dock, and where did it come from, and maybe we ought to go investigate that. Or, look, these people here are doing something, and uh, we, we didn't know about that. So, um, so that's going to be a, a very important application. But on the commercial side, uh, agriculture is very, very, very important. So uh, think about a regime where uh, uh, a farmer uh, may take a, a small handheld drone toss it into the air, it'll work like a lawnmower over his fields, collect data, come back and land. Uh, the data may go off somewhere to be analyzed, and uh, within uh, maybe hours or maybe sooner, that farmer gets back a report that says, you know, you didn't need so much fertilizer, so don't put so much fertilizer down here, or give this part of your crop a little more water, or you've got a problem over here with uh, with uh, some some weeds that are growing here, and uh, and and that'll make farmers much more productive, and it'll be a, a very uh, uh, when you think about um, 
uh, amateurizing the expense of that across a lot of farmers, it becomes a very, very inexpensive thing to do. And it opens up opportunities for those who build those little aircraft, those who build the software, those that understand and analyze the data, those that build the, the sensors that go on it. So you can see how it, it changes our economy somewhat and will create jobs. Could we do uh, flying transportation machines? Something like, uh, could it jump on a, on a uh, small private taxi, flying taxi? Well, and go? I, Is that uh, possible? I think, uh, Attila, that you will see in your lifetime, uh, you'll get on a commercial aircraft where there won't be a pilot. I, I think that's very, very possible. And the only, the only thing that's preventing that is, uh, is the, the cultural uh, response to that. Would you feel comfortable getting on an airplane where there was no pilot? Now, I, I told you that I was a pilot. I, I had a, a career in the Navy flying airplanes. And, uh, and, and my view of this is that uh, you can probably be safer with, uh, with an auto autonomous commercial aircraft than you are when the pilots are up front. Number one, uh, nobody can uh, coerce them to do something they don't want to do. Mm. Think about 9-11. Would, would that, was, was that possible if that were an unmanned aircraft? Uh, much more difficult to do something like that. So security. Well, so it's more security. vulnerable though. And, too, right? um, I don't believe so, no. I don't think so? No, because the c controls aren't accessible from, from the aircraft itself. Mm. And they can be operated from a very secure location. So, uh, so I, I think we'll see that happen. Uh, I think we'll see it first in freight. I think we'll see it first uh, somewhere, unfortunately, somewhere other than in the United States, uh, because uh, you know, as a practical matter, uh, we have some very strong unions uh, that uh -huh. that you know may uh, it may be another obstacle to overcome because change always brings with it uh, people that that don't want to change or or have a vested interest in not changing. But, um, but it will, in the end, it makes Hawaii a much more accessible place because it'll be so much less expensive to be able to go visit the mainland or go visit Asia uh, from Hawaii uh, once we, we, we no longer, uh, you know, have these other costs involved. And, and it is difficult because it involves change. So, uh, you know, the workforce is going to have to adapt to this. But, but in the long run, uh, there are tremendous benefits. So you think the, that if we eliminate pilots and make them all electronic, then the cost is going to go down, not because the cost of fuel or the cost of the machines themselves, the airplanes, or even the cost of the software. It's going to be because it's going to be a much more efficient system. A much more efficient system to operate. And you know, I, I heard the same thing. There, were, there was a company out of California making robots to do the menial tasks on a forum, like take the sack of potatoes from here to there, or pick strawberries. I think that was strawberry and fruit picking. Uh, robot, so and it's the same idea. They're trying to lower the cost to actually do to get the same. Exactly, results. and and the consumer eventually benefits, but there are people who will be displaced from their current work. Um, you know, think about longshoremen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a couple of years ago we had a big strike on the West Coast, and uh, one of the settlement uh, 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 tenants. Uh, you know, one, one of the tenets of their agreement was that they couldn't bring automation too fast to the docks because it displaced workers. So the technology was available to do things with, with you know, automated forklifts and, and more technology, oh, right. but, uh, but it would cost jobs in the short run. But in the long run, it, it creates wealth and it benefits the consumer. Uh, but there are people that are going to have to transition. As and that always. Is, as always, it's just that change will come faster, and when change comes fast, it's always uh, somewhat painful. Well, that's all right. That's, that's what we live for, right? <laughs> exactly. If you're not changing, you're not living. Exactly. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my Larry. pleasure. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, of course, if you like this show, feel free to leave comments down here below. I'm your host, Attila Suress for Think Tech Friday. And with us today, of course, was Larry Osborne. He's the Chief Strategy Officer for DreamHaver. Stay tuned for, next, uh, for more Think Tech next week on Friday. And of course, tune in to thinktechhawaii.com all week long. We've got lots of shows for you. Have a great weekend. Aloha.